happy Thursday. Good morning, PSW staff, clients, friends joining us for, okay, this is, you know, so we looked at Taxi Driver. The results are in. We're going to see that tomorrow. Great job on that. That's really fun. Um, so that was, we, Bernard Herman's score was an alto saxophone, you know, for the emotional jazz, you know, smooth jazz scene. So we're going to look at a saxophonist today, revisit one of the most famous, although he's tenor. And, uh, but we'll talk about that. Today we're going to look at and revisit Oliver Nelson. Oliver Nelson is, if you don't know the name, that's okay. Um, everybody should know his name. He's very famous. If for some reason he never got the recognition or the the clout that Miles Davis or John Coltrane got, and um, maybe because he didn't live that long, but I'm not really sure why. We'll, we'll figure out, but he is one of the most brilliant musicians uh, of the 20th century, and in particular jazz. And for a few reasons before we get into his life one of the reasons is that he was so brilliant at you know we had we looked at big bands they're still big bands today but we looked at glenn miller and artie shaw and um, tommy dorsey big band those guys were in the you know 40s mostly right so oliver nelson he uses that but he does he has weight he, he has less musicians you know, rather than like a 20, 30, 40 piece big band, um, he uses six or seven guys. And he still somehow maintains that large sound. And that's through his brilliant orchestrating um, of, for the instruments. Uh, really hard to do. Uh, and Quincy Jones also was able to do that too. But to be able to take a, make a very small group sound large uh, was is a is a really good trick, but also skill and technique. Um, you know, he was kind of writing big band music for a small ensemble, and he liked that. He said that he, he liked that, probably because of the challenge, and not just because it's challenging because that's good, but also challenging because it it has a different sound. We'll we'll hear why it sounds like big band, but it's not a big band. Um, and the other reason why it's important is that. His music, and this is really um, interesting because usually when you hear that something is uh, difficult and complex, it usually doesn't, you know, sound fun. You know, when somebody, if somebody s said to me, like, I have the most complex movie to tell you, um, I would like tune out probably, right? And then I would say, yeah, that, that, that's really difficult and complex. Usually that's, that's not good. His music was really difficult and um, complex, but it was extremely easy to listen to. So how does he do both? I don't know. Um, we'll, I mean, we'll have to just figure that out together. So, um, so that's why he's important for those reasons. So let's let's talk about his early life, and then we'll have fun with the uh, very famous album, "The Blues and the Abstract Truth." So he's uh, Oliver Nelson's born into a musical family. Literally, everyone played an instrument. Um, he's born in 1932 in St. Louis and starts playing piano at age six. And uh, several years later, picks up the saxophone and starts playing in big bands pretty early in life. He joins Louis uh, Jordan's uh, band uh, while he's still playing in his teens. He's uh, playing alto saxophone and arranging their charts. Then he serves in the U.S. Marine Corps uh, in Japan and Korea, playing in the band, and then comes back home to uh, St. Louis and starts uh, studying formal uh, classical composition. Most jazz musicians, you know, a few we've talked about, did get the formal training. Miles Davis was at Juilliard for a little bit. We talked about Nadia Boulanger the other day and how she said, you know, master, master your art, your technique so well so you can develop your own voice. Don't disregard what's obvious in your path. And so with Oliver Nelson, he decides he needs to or wants to learn classical music. And he studies classical composition in 1954 at the Washington University in St. Louis. And continues studying there and um, his friend Phil Woods who's a famous saxophone player in his own right said that Oliver would, would eat lunch in his car during these uh, school days because of the segregation and all of that kind of 
um, terrible, terrible stuff that was going on. And the irony is it that he was asked later to guest lecture there. So when he moves to New York in 1959, he starts meeting musicians that um, are people that we've talked about. And he really starts um, uh, beginning to do his most famous album, album people that non-jazz listeners would buy, um, Blues and the Abstract Truth. This album comes out in 1961, and this is a gateway jazz album, and I mean that in a way that it got people that weren't interested particularly in jazz. Um, it, it caught their ear, in particular with Stolen Moments, which is the song we're listening to now and the song that opened up the class. So this album has some of the best players going on at that time, um, and this is kind of the hard bop era, right? So we had bebop, and then uh, in, the, in the 40s and 50s, late 50s early 60s with Coltrane and Miles we get modal jazz and kind of hard bop with Lee Morgan as well um, but he gets Freddie Hubbard in, uh, on trumpet who, who was a lot kind of like Lee Morgan in, in, a, in a way that we'll talk about in another class um, he has Eric Dolphy who we did a class on uh, he has jo George Barrow on um, baritone saxophone he has Bill Evans on piano who uh, we talked about on the Kind of Blue album uh, Paul Chambers on bass, who's on uh, the Kind of Blue album, and Roy Haynes on drums. So, if yes, I've said it a few times. He, this is a really uh, Oliver Nelson really takes. There's is very influenced by Miles Davis Kind of Blue, which came out two years before this album. It doesn't sound like it, but the more I think about it, I can see why some people might think that um, it is minimal. And in the sense that it's not, it's there aren't several jazz chord changes going on. It doesn't sound like it's busy music in a sense. Also, what's interesting is that all, all, all the compositions on the album follow some sort of 12-bar blues form. And even though each song sounds completely different than the next, uh, my favorite is Hoedown from the album. that we talked about from Aaron Copeland and that was, you know, Richard Rogers influenced by. Uh, he's kind of doing this in, in a jazz way. I mean, where would you ever hear music like this? Harmonically, here's what's interesting about it. Okay, so if you have a, uh, and we won't get too technical, but if you have a chord, a C chord, a C triad, C, E, G, right? His harmony is chordal harmony. So quarter quarter is is four, right? Is a quarter is a fourth of a dollar. Um, quartet is, is four players. So chordal is is a type of harmony that so C to F is a, is a, a fourth. The interval is a fourth. His harmony are is instead of using thirds, which is usually um, very um, common in big bands, especially Glenn Miller and Tommy. Dorsey and all those. Um, instead of using thirds, he's using fourths, and they sound like this. They sound a little bit, do you hear how it sounds a little bit different? It's not dissonant, but there's something a little bit modern or um, different sounding. So he's kind of one of the first, probably, yeah, one of the first, for sure, jazz big band writers writing in a modern way, um, if that makes sense, in a, in a way that's using chordal harmony. Um, instead of always resolving the fourth to the third, the F to the E in the case of C, ma C major. So that's Blues in the Abstract Truth. One of the most famous jazz albums, probably just as famous as Kind of Blue, or just as iconic and uh, powerful and meaningful. Um, he moves to Los Angeles in the late uh, 60s 
1967, he goes to L.A., and he starts getting a lot of work in film and TV uh, and, and scoring and arranging for film and TV, and uh, unfortunately dies from a massive heart attack at 43 in 1975. Um, but I believe his son is still carrying on his legacy playing his music. Genius um, composer, arranger, um, you know, conductor, saxophonist, visionary, real visionary. And in the sense that it was still easy to listen to, right? Like we talked about at the beginning, it was still melodic music, but it was, it had a complexity to it that you didn't notice. But, but somebody on the radio would be like, hey, turn that up. That's a cool song. That This is, this is what, you know, this song grooves. Um, that's, I think, what's so important uh, about Oliver Nelson's music. So hope you enjoyed it. Um, uh, love that guy. Yeah, what, what, what a talent. So he, hope you enjoyed that. He, so he was tenor saxophonist, but a composer, a ranger, right? Life, you know, didn't live too long, unfortunately. But Gershwin took classical music um, that we're, we're going to see Gershwin next week, took jazz into the concert hall. Oliver Nelson, I'm just getting ahead of myself. Oliver Nelson today took a small group and made it, to, made it sound larger. Maybe, you know, so a small, writing big band music for a small ensemble that sounded bigger. Now, maybe he got this idea from Louis Jordan, because as we just saw in the class, he played in Louis Jordan's band. And if we remember, Louis Jordan was really economical and great at many things. But instead of writing, hiring a big, big band, he can get six to eight guys and they can play really loud. Especially, this is kind of before amplification, but most maybe a good time in late 40s louis jordan's doing that so maybe oliver nelson was like huh i can get a big sound but not have to pay 40 guys or something i can pay 10 guys and we can maybe come up with some new harmonies new colors and all that kind of stuff so that, that was just kind of something i thought about with louis jordan too because he did that too um okay so that's oliver nelson um tomorrow film's growing results for taxi driver can't wait to share that with you have a great rest of the day see you tomorrow bye